friends welcome back to the channel i hope you guys are all doing really really well so it's been a while since i've done a reading wrap up and that's for several reasons so i've been in a horrible reading slump over the past couple of months and it stemmed from uh some issues that i was having with my mental illnesses and um, some stresses that i had going on in my personal life so i hadn't been reading much of anything uh we've watched a whole lot of movies and shows and stuff like that but my reading really did suffer I just had to take a step back and something that happens with me when I'm in a mental crisis is I actually get kind of amnesia where it's very PC um, you know the the memories from the past few weeks have been very PC so you know I can't remember a whole lot of what I've done or what I've read or what I've watched so I really had to go back and think about these books and what I thought about them and it was really great to go back and just kind of develop those memories so I can talk to you guys about them so I don't know if anybody else here deals with uh, the same sort of things but it's something that happens to me unfortunately when I get into a really bad spot reading almost always does not happen and with what I do read sometimes it's really really hard to remember it so I'm going to put together um, just the couple of books that I've read I'm also going to do a separate video of the movies and shows that I watched for old school April figured I keep them separate and then hopefully going forward I can give you guys regular monthly wrap-ups again and let me just tell you it is so smoky here so I don't know if you've heard on the news or if you live within Canada, Alberta, the province of Alberta is basically on fire. We have fire season pretty much every summer, but it usually doesn't start until like July, August. But we have like raging wildfires. The military is here and today is like apocalyptic. So if you look outside, the sun is red, it's smoky, you can't see anything and the smoke has like this yellowy tinge to it. It's totally dark and it's windy, it's very, very eerie. And uh, so I've got a drink today. I've got a, my little skull full of Diet Pepsi because my basement where my library is smells like a wildfire. It smells like a campfire down here. So um, I'm gonna try to get through this video. I've already recorded one and then I'm gonna stop talking because the smoke in the air is just terrible. On the other hand though, I am currently reading The Exorcist on audiobook and I'm buddy, re buddy reading it with someone and I thought today is the perfect day to sit down and read The Exorcist because it is so damn apocalyptic out there. So just the, the ambiance was here for my reading day. So we'll take that as one positive of this whole situation. So the first couple of stories I wanted to talk to you guys about, and I'm gonna go through these very, very briefly because I already spoke about them in a recent vlog that I did. Um, so out of Stephen King's Night Shift, so this is a short story collection, I read Children of the Corn and Sometimes They Come Back and then I watched the movies and I did all of that as part of Old School April. So uh, Children of the Corn, which is funny because I'm in a real religious horror kick right now, uh, Children of the Corn was okay for me. I did watch the movie when I was a kid. I've never read the story, so I'm glad I did go back and read the story. Um, it was okay. Not great. The movie was okay. I think I enjoyed it a lot better when I was a kid than, than now. But the characters themselves are super creepy, aren't they? So, you know, that's all I'll say about Children of the Corn. It was kind of like a three-star read for me. But sometimes they come back, and I mentioned this in the vlog as well, Sometimes They Come Back for me is such a great story in its emotion. So if you don't know anything about the story, basically this young boy, um, his older brother is murdered and he witnesses it. And you know, it really affects him. And now he's older, he's a school teacher, and he actually gets a posting back in his, in his old hometown where the tragedy happened. And he's having a lot of difficulty with like PTSD and the emotions coming out and nightmares and all of that kind of thing. And some creepy, crazy stuff starts to happen to him. And Stephen King is just, you know, so good at the family dynamic, like horror with family dynamic and horror with a lot of emotion to it. Like if you think of things like Pet Cemetery and stuff like that, it has very much the same thing. And this story does as well. I have to say that the book and the movie follow along, you know, almost, almost identically. There's a few changes, but they are very, very similar. 
and I watched the movie Sometimes They Come Back, which I think is an underappreciated horror movie actually. When I was a kid, I, I think I must have watched it 30 times when I was a teenager, but I had never read the story. So I hadn't seen the movie for, you know, say over 25 years. So I wanted to read the story since I had the book in my collection and then go back and watch the movie. And the movie, while it does have that level of emotion and everything in it, uh, I think it hit me more as an adult with those aspects, with the emotion, than when I was a kid. But it also did have that wonderful, cheesy 80s horror. And uh, it is a very cheesy movie. The kills are very cheesy. And it, it is actually kind of funny in, in some parts. So I would consider it kind of like a, on the cusp of being a horror comedy, almost, in some regards. But like I said, it does still have that very deep dynamic of, you know, family and grief and PTSD and what this school teacher is going through. So for me, it was a, it was a good story. I think probably because of the nostalgia factor. So I gave it four stars for the movie. Please go rent it. It's a good time. It's, you know, only about 90 minutes or so. And even my husband really enjoyed it. It's, I would put it along the same lines of, uh, like people under the stairs with the cheesiness and kind of the the comedy but it also has like really deep meaning and stuff like that so really enjoyed my time with those ones and then really getting into kind of the meat and bones of some reviews here uh way back in february i took part in a readathon it was the gothic hearts reading challenge and i wrapped up most of the books that i, I had read then but i was currently reading rebecca i hadn't finished it yet i read it on audiobook and uh, so i wanted to save all of my thoughts for when of course i i had gotten through the entire book and then life just kind of started to fall apart and i haven't been able to wrap it up for you guys so rebecca I, it's a classic for a reason it is so good you know, I was a little bit worried at the beginning because it was kind of slow moving, it was kind of meandering, but man oh man did it ever pick up. So if you've never read this book, and this is part of kind of a challenge that I'm doing with myself that I want to read more classics, I want to read more gothic horror, and I want to read, you know, even if they're not classics, but just kind of older horror. So I thought this was perfect to fit in here. I keep hearing about it. I've never read it, never watched the movie, knew nothing about the story. So if you don't know anything about the story, basically we follow this young woman who is unnamed actually. And she's a companion for an older lady. So back, you know, in, in the 20s and 30s and stuff, older rich women used to have companions, especially if they were widows. And this woman is in her early 20s. So she's very young. She doesn't have a whole lot of family, like there's, you know, a history of not great family dynamic and she becomes the companion of this woman. She gets paid, you know, a very small salary and has to kind of take care of herself. So they go to a hotel and it's kind of like this old woman wanted to have a vacation, they're staying in this hotel. And uh, she's a real busybody and she knows everybody, of course, you can picture these types of older ladies. And uh, she starts talking to Maxim de Winter, who's uh, a bachelor, no, a widower, sorry, he's a widower in his 40s. And uh, he's very well to do and he lives in an estate called Manderley. So he's in the same hotel as them. And uh, the younger lady starts to strike up conversations with Maxim. And then they start going on drives and they start spending more and more time together. And uh, eventually he proposes after a very, very short courtship. I wouldn't even call it a courtship really. And they end up getting married and he takes her to Manderley. But the entire story is like him, Manderley, the household, everyone is haunted by the ghost or the memory of Maxim's first wife, Rebecca. So the title character of the book isn't even alive, but she has such presence. She, hello Callie. <laughs> My dog came to visit. <laughs> yeah, you, you okay? We're kind of, we kind of started, start to get haunted by this, uh, this memory of Maxim's first wife throughout the story. So I have to say at the beginning, I was, like I said, I wasn't really too sure. It was kind of slow moving. It was meandering. They go on their honeymoon 
and uh, you know this and that and and so he finally takes her to Manderley and it's this gigantic mansion imposing mansion and the she gets introduced to his household staff and <laughs> there's this uh, housekeeper her name is Mrs. Danvers and she's such an amazing character she's one of those unlikable characters and uh, all I can picture is Victoria's mother from the corpse bride that's how I picture Mrs. Danvers she really undermines the new young Mrs. De Winter she looks down her nose at her um, she really doesn't fit in she doesn't fit this lifestyle kind of what is she doing here sort of thing he's you know like twice her age and um, Mrs. Danvers is still infatuated with her her mistress of the house uh, Rebecca the first Mrs. De Winter and so I'm sorry my dog is very needy and I'm giving her scratches so the young Mrs. De Winter is really struggling she's struggling to fit in and you know the household she's very awkward with them she doesn't really know what to do she doesn't know how to be the mistress of a house and Mrs. Danvers like I said besides undermining her she's kind of leading her astray a little bit so as the story starts to develop and we start learning more about Rebecca and Maxim and all of this it turns into the most wonderful psychological mystery is I guess the best way that I can describe it it's just fantastic and the story just starts to unravel so I'd say that the last you know 50 to 60 percent of the book I was hooked in I was just under the spell of Manderley and Rebecca and Maxim's former life and then with the character of the young Mrs. De Winter we're kind of seeing her start to develop and she learns something and there becomes a shift in the dynamic of her and Maxim's relation relationship and it's just fantastic so at the beginning of the story Maxim is very hard he's very uh you know gaslighty and he doesn't treat her very well and you know i really kind of hated him but as the story started to flow along it was just beautiful i enjoyed every minute of it once it got started to to come together and like i said it's a classic for a reason i couldn't get over the ending of the book it's one of those books that is going to stick with me for a really, really long time, and I think it has to go on my list of all-time favorite horror. Even though I wouldn't really classify it as a horror, it's more of a psychological thriller, but it is just fantastic. So after I read the book, I did watch the 1940s version of the movie with uh, Laurence Olivier and who's the other actress? Judith Anderson. And Laurence Olivier, who I love, by the way, uh, he also plays Heathcliff in a 1930s version of Wuthering Heights. I thought he was cast perfectly as Maxim and Judith Anderson really did play that meek, mild, young 20-something year old woman who is now the mistress of this grand house and she doesn't know what she's doing. So both of those characters I think were cast really really well and um, but the one thing I think was, was missing with the movie, both with Maxim and with uh, Mrs. Danvers, is it lacked the level of emotion, just raw emotion and raw kind of hatred or whatever, or grief that was really evident in the book. So there's um, a scene in the book that there's a ball and something happens during the ball and Mrs. Danvers finally lets loose everything she thinks about the new Mrs. De Winter and there is raw emotion and the scene in the movie just didn't live up to it so I felt that the movie was lacking a little bit of emotion in that fact so those are my thoughts on Rebecca uh, it's a fantastic story if you haven't read it and you like gothic horror and you like kind of those slow burns that build up to this huge story I would highly highly recommend it it was I, I think I, I think I gave it a four and a half star and the only reason why I didn't give it a five star rating was because uh, of 
you know, it was kind of slow at the beginning. That's the only reason, but it was so, so good. And I would highly recommend reading it on audiobook as well, because you can hear, like I said, the, the emotion that the actors kind of brought to the story. So that was read way back in February and March, but I'm so glad I finally get to share my thoughts with you. If you're looking for more information on Rebecca, my friend over at Happy Haunts Library did a fantastic uh, review and kind of analysis of the story. She really goes into a lot of detail and her thoughts and, and you know the gaslighting and the relationship between Maxim and the new Mrs. De Winter. So if you're looking for more information on Rebecca, I'll have her video linked down below. And the next book I wanted to talk to you guys about was Tastes Like Candy by Ivy Tholen and this was recommended to me of course by my wonderful friend Kelsey over at Slime and Slashers. I've heard her talk about it I don't know a dozen times and I mean the cover is amazing as well. So I finally wanted to pick this up and I think I chose this one uh, because it had neon on the cover. So I, I, I love the cover of this book. I think Kelsey actually said recently I've got to look into this, but I think she said recently that you can get this in like the cover of the book in merch, in merch, like merchandise. So I'll have to look into that because it's just fantastic. So this is a slasher book and it revolves around a group of uh, teenagers who are just finishing up high school. They're waiting to get their acceptance letters from college and all of that. And they have a tradition that uh, a, a specific group will be invited to take part in a scavenger hunt at an abandoned carnival. So this group gets their invitations and they go into the carnival, end up getting trapped in there with a killer and just chaos ensues. So this is outside of what I typically read for horror. I don't read a whole lot of slashers. I don't read a whole lot of body horror. I'm more along the lines of psychological thriller and haunted houses and, and all of those sorts of things. Uh, but I have to say that this book was so fast paced and imaginative that I had such a fun time with it. And the part that I really, really enjoyed Besides the fact that there was a high body count and the kills themselves were very imaginative and very gory to the po to the point where I almost had to skim over certain parts because I was like, okay, I don't <laughs> I can just skim over that. I don't need to go in too deep. Uh, because like I said, it's not typically my thing. But it was so imaginative and each one of the kills had a carnival theme that was wrapped into the kill. So like there's one that, you know, it, there's a dunk tank and, you know, some other carnival goodies around that this killer uses to uh, knock off all of these kids one by one. And then of course you have, your, your brain gets turning of who is this person? Is it somebody in the group? Is it somebody, you know, one of the additional characters from outside that we've met, or is it someone that's completely, you know, ambiguous to us and we'll find out at the end. So it really had me thinking of, oh, I think it's this person. Oh, I think it's that person. And uh, so it, it was really great. I enjoyed my time with it. So like I said, outside of what I typically read, but I just love the imagination of this one. So I gave it four stars. You know, I would recommend it to you, especially if you do like books with like higher body counts and gory kills and stuff like that. It reminded me of my time uh, with Clown in a Cornfield, which was another one that I enjoyed. So that was uh, Tastes Like Candy by Ivy Tholen. And then the last book that I wanted to talk to you about was The Haunting by Alex Bell. And as you guys know, because I've talked about it a dozen times on this channel, I love the Frozen, Char the Frozen Charlotte duology by Alex Bell two of my favorite books of all time. I reread them this year and they were just as fantastic as the first time I read them. And so I wanted to pick up, up this one because I loved her writing so much and if it had the same amount of creep factor then I knew it was going to be an amazing read. So in this book we follow Emma and when Emma was a child she had a, a debilitating accident at an inn called the Water Witch. So the Water Witch is actually an inn that's owned by her grandmother and it, it's a cursed inn. It's a haunted inn because it is built from sa uh, salvaged timber from a cursed ship that's called the Water Witch. So now we're 10-15 years down the road. Emma is living in another town with her parents. Like I said, she's confined to a wheelchair and she wants to go back and visit her grandmother. She's been writing to her grandmother and she wants to go back and visit her. 
So when she gets back into uh, her old hometown, she actually touches base with an, uh, a childhood friend and his sister that were actually there the day that she had her accident. And she's been out of touch with them for, you know, the time that she hasn't been living there. So they start to rekindle their friendship and uh, we get wrapped into this story of the haunting and the curse of the inn, the water witch. And a few things that I really, really enjoy with this book. So obviously haunted inn, cursed inn. So I really like the haunting aspect of it. Uh, I thought it was well done and it's imaginative. But the other layer on that is that with Emma being in a wheelchair, it really adds the complexity of having a disability in a horror story, which is not something that you read a whole lot. So that adds to the whole, um, you know, the whole story and how Emma has to get out of these situations. And then there's a really difficult part to this story. So uh, her friend, uh, her childhood friend and his sister, actually come from an abusive home and we experience the dynamic and everything between these kids and their father. So between flashbacks, between things that are happening now, because you know they're only 17 I believe, and uh, they're really struggling with, with this situation with their dad. So it has that really deep-seated hatred that you would have for a parent like this and the emotion that's wrapped into this horror story. So I really liked that angle of it because it's something that I enjoy in the horror stories that I read. But if you do find, um, you know, DV really hard to deal with, even I found it hard to deal with uh, reading it at certain places, then just letting you know that that's in there. And there is also a scene of animal cruelty. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, that those are in there. But what I really enjoyed, like I said, you've got the haunting, you've got a, a paraplegic main character, you have the emotion and the family dynamic of these kids and their dad. And what I really noticed was that it didn't hold back. It didn't hold back with the, the goriness of what was happening. It didn't hold back with the haunting. And it actually had a lot of folklore that was wrapped into it as well. And I love folklore in my horror. You guys know that I love The Last Apprentice series by Joseph Delaney. And I found that this one had very much the same sort of thing, like Alex Bell's other books with the Frozen Charlotte story. So I really enjoyed all of those facts. Um, but it did fall short for me. So I don't know if it's because I have Frozen Charlotte on such a high pedestal, but I just felt that this one wasn't up to the same level. Not saying that it's a bad book, I enjoyed it. I gave it uh, three and a half stars, but it still wasn't at the same level as Frozen Charlotte, which was kind of what I had my expectations set at. But having said that, if you wanna check out the Red Eye series uh, and this book specifically, I would definitely still recommend it. So there you guys go, that is everything I read recently. Let me know down below, have you guys read any of these books? And let me know your thoughts, but until next time, stay spooky everybody, bye.